thank you all for coming. I'm sure, I, I think a few more people will trickle in, so hopefully they aren't too loud. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming. I just want to say we've got a fantastic panel. Um, we've got Sir Oliver Letwin, author of a very well-received review that the government commissioned on why large housing developments tend to be built so slowly, and also the Member of Parliament for West Dorset. Uh, Alex Cunningham, uh, Shadow Housing Minister for two and a half weeks, and Member of Parliament for Stockton North. Unfortunately, John Healy couldn't come today here to attend a constituency funeral. He sends his apologies, but I'm happy for Alex, which is brilliant. So thank you to Alex for stepping in at such short notice. And Yolanda Barnes, who's chair of the Bartlett Real Estate Institute at UCL, and all-round doyen of housing and urban policy. Uh, so I'm Jack Airy. I'm head of housing policy here at Policy Exchange. Um, before we get into discussion, I just quickly want to say why we're holding today's event. Uh, as I'm just sure you're all aware, and probably all experienced, the country has a housing shortage. Its epicenter is London and the South East, but this shortage is no means confined to the capital and its commuter belt. Uh, politicians are very fond of saying that they'll solve this problem, but no government and no mayor has come up with a plan that deals with, deals with this shortage in a meaningful way. Bigger and bolder solutions are needed, and one idea that we think needs a great deal more consideration is the building of major, big new settlements. Um, whether these major settlements are called new towns, garden cities, or something else. They're an idea that has worked in the past, albeit with uh, various levels of success and with many lessons to be learned. Big new settlements are also an idea that is popular with the public. Uh, in a poll of 5,000 people that Policy Exchange ran last year, 56% of respondents supported the building of new places in suburban and rural areas. 79% supported the building of garden cities. They're much more popular than, for instance, high-rise building in cities. Yet, as major housing developments are necessitating a lot of government support and coordination, there are major obstacles to getting these new settlements built, not least um, their location. In short, where can land come forward for new settlements in areas people want to live that could also support a higher population? Clearly, this is an issue fused with small p and big p politics. Then there's government policy. Planning policy and public subsidy, public subsidy don't really facilitate major new housing development where it's needed government simply isn't set up to support new settlements, so how might this change? Uh, and then thirdly, what are the new settlements going to be like? Who will they be built for? What will they look like? Clearly with new technology, new, te new construction techniques and different expectations, a new place built today will look quite different to one that is built just after the war. But if the government is going to back the building of new settlements, it must demand that they're beautiful and affordable. So these are just three obstacles to building a new generation of places, I'm sure we'll discuss many more over the next hour. May it also promote uh, Policy Exchange's most recent housing report, which is called Tomorrow's Places, um, which uh, puts forward a strategy for overcoming these hurdles. Uh, now uh, we're we'll getting to the big event, so what we're going to do is have introductory remarks from each of the speakers. First, Oliver, then Alex, then Yolanda, and then we'll go to you guys for some interesting questions, please. So, with that, I'll hand over to Sir Oliver. Um, well, thank you very much. C can I just check, is this audible at the back? Excellent. Um, uh, I, um, I learned as a um, school child and as a student always to answer the question set in an examination. So instead of giving you a long and learned talk about my recent report, I'm going to answer the question posed by the, um, this uh, gathering. If people want to talk about the report, obviously I'm happy to do that in the question and answer session. Um, uh, and uh, I was also um, taught that it's a good idea to answer the question briefly, if possible. And I can answer the question posed for this uh, seminar very briefly. Uh, it's with the word yes. Um, I, I do think that it makes sense for um, this country to think very, very much more seriously about, and indeed to uh, implement, a policy of... Um, creating uh, a number of, uh, whatever you call them, new towns, uh, garden cities, or whatever. Um, uh, I accept all the points that uh, were made about the intrinsic uh, difficulty. Everybody's in favor of this until they discover it's anywhere near them, and uh, um, all, all, all sorts of people think it's a splendid idea until they start thinking about the politics of actually making it happen anywhere, and um, there are all sorts of economic considerations and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but I think actually uh, we are very likely not to achieve as good a solution to the uh, housing challenges that we face as we could do 
if we were to embark on a substantial, uh, a few substantial new places, um, the building of substantial new places. I, I do think that in order to do that, we have to follow uh, a route which is very, very different from the route that has been followed in constructing uh, uh, so-called large, in many cases much smaller, sites um, uh, in the UK over the past 20 or 30 years, and that is relevant to uh, my report. I, it seems to me if we're to, to succeed in this at all, uh, the places that we create have actually to be places. Um, uh, the, the, the phrase place-making is one that I've heard endlessly uh, wandering around um, uh, housing construction sites uh, in, in, in our country. And um, uh, the phrase is used without meaning um, uh, because the uh, product is all too often the opposite of a place. It's of extremely clearly uh, serried ranks of uh, undifferentiated objects um, uh, and doesn't even feel like a place at all. Um, uh, and um, uh, the next thing I want to say is that part of the answer to that, the sort of easy part of the answer, is, is what I described in my report. And we have in this room some distinguished exponents of some aspects of that. Uh, my colleague Richard Bacon, for example, on shared ownership. The part of the answer is not to have a sort of monoglot development, but to differentiate widely between all sorts of different tenures and types of houses, um, self-build, custom-build, shared ownership, affordable, rented, uh, um, social rented housing, open market sale housing, large housing, small housing, and so on. Um, uh, that's very, very important because um, uh, you're not going to create a, 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 a new entity, a large new entity that feels at all like a place if you try to start with a, a, a view that it's got to be of a particular kind. Neither will you be able to sell or rent or whatever it is, the single monoglot item that you're trying to create nor will anyone want to live there by choice. They will only live there by necessity if it's all the same as everything else there. Um, and uh, uh, therefore, it'll be slow, cumbersome, awkward, unpleasant. So that's not what I'm recommending. Um, it needs to be variegated. But actually, um, if we're to succeed in producing uh, new settlements, large new settlements that are real places, um, uh, we have to do something much more uh, adventurous than just to make them um, uh, variegated uh, in tenure and type and size and so on. Um, we need to make them um, be places that people actually want to live. Um, it's, it's a very, very strange phenomenon which I remarked on um, some years back uh, at, at a time when uh, I didn't really realise that it would be the final nail in the coffin of my political career, uh, and I mentioned the word beauty in a, in a, in a talk I gave, uh, since when I've never been able to be taken seriously politically by anybody at all. Um, it's incredibly unfashionable to talk about beauty in our society. You can talk about wealth, you can talk about crime, you can talk about tax, you can talk about death, but you can't really talk about beauty while anybody uh, takes you seriously for some reason which I've never managed to fathom. Um, uh, and what makes this so very, very strange is that actually in our ordinary, sensible, everyday lives, the, the lives we actually lead as human beings, I, I suspect that nearly everybody in this room feels as I feel. Uh, you wake up in the morning, the kind of day it is, the sights you see, the sunlight through green leaves, the, uh, the architecture around you, the countryside if you're lucky enough to live in it, these are things of enormous emotional significance in our lives. Uh, and incidentally, if, 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 if you want to turn from things we actually all know which are true to things which have the appearance of truth because they're sort of well documented in highly articulated academic studies, there's a huge pile of sociological evidence that the aesthetic surroundings that people grow up in have an enormous impact, wholly unsurprisingly, on their uh, psychological and emotional development. Somehow or other, uh, it's very unfashionable to think that this actually matters uh, when it, it comes to building 
homes, but of course that's where it most matters of all. I mean, it's very, 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 very important indeed that there should be cathedrals and art galleries and um, great sculptures and wonderful landscapes. But actually the place we most spend our time in is our homes. And so if we care about aesthetics, um, it's in the building of our homes and the surroundings of our homes that it most counts to most of us. And if you look at the great examples of uh, either new settlements or great changes in great uh, parts of great cities that have been brought about, if you look at, uh, at Rennes or at Haussmann or at uh, Nash or at Lutyens, uh, what you find is a mind that is applied to the question how to make a place be a place that people want to live in. And that has all sorts of components and come in many different varieties. Um, uh, but it certainly does not arise by committee. Um, it does not come about by following a pattern book. Um, and uh, it isn't going to be achieved by uh, 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 groups of economists and accountants and engineers. It actually requires people who care about aesthetics to dominate in the original conception of the place that is produced. And um, uh, so I would add to your list of challenges that if we are to find uh, large new places in which we create a new place by um, ordaining that over not too long a period many, many homes are built there amidst many other things. Places for people to be at school and to work and to live uh, in every other way, uh, but also, of course, landscape and, uh, and setting. Um, if we're to do that, we actually have to be willing to uh, accept the idea that there will need to be a ruling mind of, of an architect in the world. Or, of, a, of, a, of a, a, a whatever you like to call it, an, an, a, a, an urban planner, a, a designer, uh, somebody who has a conception of an aesthetic whole and who also understands the practical realities that are intertwined with that, which is what, of course, makes architecture so extraordinary amongst the arts and so different from uh, a painting or sculpture or music or whatever. It has to work. It has to work in a way that's beautiful. The beauty has to help it work. It has to sell, and it has to sell in part because it is beautiful. Um, and uh, that requires something extraordinary in our country at this time. Uh, all the examples I cited are examples of people who one way or another were given power by centers of power that um, were not highly accountable. Um, uh, the Prince Regent didn't ask anybody when he commissioned Nash to create Regent's Park. He just commissioned Nash. Um, and uh, uh, Napoleon III certainly didn't ask anybody when he told Hausmann to rebuild Paris. Um, uh, and uh, you couldn't do that quite that way now. So there's quite a significant, I don't mean in the sense of party political, because I think actually there's a great deal of common ground politically in, in party terms on this, but there's quite a significant challenge for all of us as politicians if we're going to try to find a means of enabling somebody to be commissioned to do such work. The last thing I want to say is I, I have a particular feeling about this, I think because as it happens in my own constituency, um, uh, the Prince of Wales has created Poundbury, which is not an enormous settlement by any means, not nearly as big as the kinds of things I think we're going to need to think of. Um, but it is a place, or it's emerging as a place. It's controversial. Some people love it, some people don't. Uh, enough people love it so that it's very much sought after. It has a huge variegation of type in it. And one of the great joys of it is that as you go around, you can't tell which are the Guinness Trust homes for the single mums and which are the £300,000 open market for sale homes. Um, uh, and it has a somewhat eccentric originator called Leon Cryer. Um, uh, but somebody who actually had a vision and was put in charge. But of course, ironically, because we're not now living in an absolute monarchy, it was the son of the monarch who commissioned that. Uh, and uh, although he had to go through all the business, or anyway felt he had to uh, go through the business of getting planning permission and all that, actually it was pretty top-downish. And so the last thing I want to say is I suspect that if we are going to see this kind of thing happening, it's going to have to be something like a mayor that does it. I, I doubt uh, it can be done centrally. 
and uh, I doubt it can be done by the ordinary process of local government. And that means you need some kind of new structure, I think, if you are actually going to get such a thing going in, in our country today. But I very much hope we can, because I believe that if we can, we can achieve, and this is the final thing I want to say, uh, we can achieve something remarkable, which is that we can prove that actually very large-scale new housing development can be popular. I, I actually believe that once something really beautiful is built, people will not only accept it, but welcome it. There will be the resistance to begin with, but when they see what's created, their attitudes change. And I've seen that happen with Poundbury in my own constituency. Um, it's an utterly different phenomenon when people see that what has been built is of real quality and is a real place and that other people want to live there and that they themselves would like to live there and that it's a beautiful place to be in. Well, good afternoon and uh, thank you for having me for what is my uh, first outing since being appointed Shadow Housing Minister. And uh, I bring apologies uh, from John Healy who is attending a friend's uh, funeral in his constituencies today. I just share with you something that happened within 24 hours of my appointment to my new role. There was a tweet. We all love tweets, don't we? And it was actually a picture of all... Well, the headline was, The Last Nine housing ministers who have failed to address the housing crisis. And there's every single one of them in chronological order going backwards. So that really gave me a real lift and thought, well, I know I'm a step off being a housing minister and just being the shadow, but uh, maybe, maybe there's uh, something to be achieved in that particular world. So I hope that you're going to be gentle with me as I develop my knowledge on the path to becoming something of a housing expert, but I have a long, long way to go, and uh, therefore very much a, a prepared script this afternoon. But I'd also say to all of you in the room today that I will need help from all of you to help with my education as I uh, develop thoughts and ideas going forward. Now today's session is also significant in that I start my outing with myself very much in agreement with a colleague who sits on the government benches. I'm sure that most people outside Westminster don't actually realise how much common cause there is amongst politicians in Parliament. And, you know, I'm pleased that we can have a demonstration of that today. And, you know, I'm always very, very happy to talk about beauty and architecture. And uh, I'm pleased to tell you, Oliver, that uh, Wren actually designed our Stockton Parish Church. And uh, we're, we're very proud of that. Prior to becoming an MP, I was a local councillor, I was the cabinet member for children and young people in Stockton-on-Tees, and I learned very much about the struggles that councils have had under successive governments to do what was needed on housing. The Blair government, well, we set up the Decent Homes programme and we refurbished council houses across the country. But I know, as you do, that much more homes need to be built, more than we've built in a generation. Now, I do confess that my new town knowledge is somewhat limited. I know about Newton Aycliffe in County Durham. It's only seven miles up the road from me. And it succeeded in delivering housing and supporting infrastructure on a grand scale, as did Cumbernauld through the concrete town, although the concrete town centre there was far from pleasing on the eye. Certainly not a thing of beauty, Oliver. I also remember Milton Keynes' concrete cows Three adults and three calves, albeit created half-size. But you know, there's nothing half-size about the housing crisis in our country today. The need for more homes to be built is indisputable. There's a growing demand. We're already failing to meet it. So we need those radical changes in policy and greater investment in housing if there's going to be sufficient housing to meet future need. But we need sustainable homes, homes for life that people can actually afford to rent or to buy, homes that will be built to the highest standards, and all of have talked about this, and carbon neutral for me, offering householders energy generated in their own homes. The ambition we all share is homes for everyone, not just those with the top percentage of earners, but people from all backgrounds and situations, from professional people to those who have need for specialist accommodation because of their disabilities. So this report on new towns is very much welcome. It shows a scale of ambition that Labour shares, and I think my fellow panellists share it too. But sadly, I don't see that as an ambition that the government does share as well. 
Now, it was Labour's post-war New Towns programme that's been one of the biggest successes in post-war policy, building 32 new towns, which today are home to over 2.5 million people. We need to emulate that in the 21st century. But we must also remember that mounting task isn't just about building houses. As Oliver has said, it's about creating homes and communities. Larger scale housing building also needs schools, needs shops, needs leisure and community facilities. And just as was required after the Second World War, it's only possible if we see big actions from government and we need the public funds to commit to working in partnership with local authorities, housing associations and the private sector if we're to succeed in our ambition. But what have we seen from the government? Well, we've seen the so-called Garden City at Epsleet in Kent, which has been the subject of 36 separate announcements by ministers since 2010. But just 1,464 homes have been built there. That equates to 40 homes per press release or government announcement. In a country where we need a million new homes now, or at least within the next few days, that scale of success will leave us very much in the housing doldrums. I think we would get to work. At the heart of Labour's house building programme are our measures to tackle the dysfunctional land market to make more land available for homes more cheaply. Labour are proposing a new English sovereign land trust to work with councils to assemble land for housing backed by new compulsory purchase powers to buy land at nearer existing use value. And we've got that ambition, the drive and commitment to get to work and build the homes and communities that Britain so desperately needs. So we're pleased with Oliver Letwin's review. It's just a shame that the government's response has been so half-hearted. The review contains sound analysis that deserves a serious response from government. We also want to see a more joined up response to public land, I mentioned land already, which can be used to build low cost homes and contribute to new towns and urban extensions. At the moment, we have a situation where NHS land is being sold off to build homes that nurses can't afford to buy. Ministry of Defence land is being sold to build homes that regular personnel, can't, army personnel, can't afford to buy. So there's much more benefit to using land effectively than a capital receipt to fund projects that have nothing at all to do with housing. We would see public land being used for public good, including looking at giving councils and other public bodies the flexibility to dispose of land at less than best consideration to allow them to do this. So I'll conclude with three final points. One of reflection, one of agreement, and one of challenge. So a point of reflection. The polling done for the report shows the importance of the way we make the case for new housing development and new settlements. People want green space and well-designed housing. Perhaps that's why the announcement John Healy made yesterday about permitted development rights is so important. But we have to take communities with us. A point of agreement. One of the important insights of this report is that central government must be active in identifying and bringing forward land for development and cannot and leave it up to local councils alone, particularly given, as the report shows, just five, just five of the 25 councils on the edge of London have up-to-date local plans. And finally, a point of challenge. We'd like to see more focus beyond London and the South East. This is unmet demand in parts of the Midlands and North too, too and a central government housing focus can provide a spur to economic activity which forms part of the regional economic rebalancing so badly needed in the UK today. Our post-war new towns were built across the country, including in Scotland, the West Midlands, North East as well as around London. And we need the sort of vision in Oliver's report and I look forward to working with him and anyone else who is prepared to help us realise that ambition we all share. Thank you. to hear such consensus break out. Um, I am put in mind uh, of the sort of language that was being used uh, when, uh, back in the 60s uh, when the new towns were being invented, when um, in discussing Basildon there was great talk of beauty, um, and when we were talking uh, back then about 
uh, the provision need to provide housing. Um, it is really, really good to hear that we have moved away from just talking about provision of housing units and there is an acknowledgement that people live in neighbourhoods, they live in uh, real places and they do very much more than just uh, sleep in a house and, and travel somewhere else to work. So it's acknowledged that we, that we need to create places with an economic geography of their own, I think is very, very welcome. But of course, that has been a huge challenge and one to which the New Towns movement responded, I think correctly, in as much as it responded by acknowledging there was a very important role, not just for the product that was designed, but uh, land ownership and finance. So the land and the money piece came in uh, to it as well. Now just, uh, I think it's a huge step forward to acknowledge that we need to design methods of land ownership and, and uh, new, new ways of looking at finance. Perhaps, for example, uh, those health trusts actually continuing to own their land and deriving income rather than capital receipts from it, that sort of thing. It's increasingly being, being spoken about and I think that's uh, extremely welcome. But I think, uh, we can learn an awful lot from the mistakes of the past when we're thinking about how we design these mechanisms. And what I want to uh, set, set this in, in the context of is the fact that the nature of capital, the nature of late 20th century capital, and the way we organise land ownership um, had a very, very important impact on the way we then designed and supplied homes and indeed offices and industrial premises and so forth. And I want to try and illustrate this by uh, just briefly reporting on, on some work I did about 10, 15 years ago looking at Harlow. Harlow um, stood out in a study we did um, about human activity. So we looked at all the human activity that takes place in real places. And we found that Harlow had very little of it. It wasn't just the uh, economic life, but uh, civic society, all, all sorts of things that human beings do in places were just missing in Harlow. And we started to look as to why this might be the case. And we discovered a very large component of this was the fact that um, Hollow had been built at a time when planning use classes uh, dictated particular responses. So everything was built either as social housing, private sector housing, uh, offices, shops or industrial. That, that was it. And in real places, beautiful places, people do one hell of a lot more than just those, those four things. And successful places have lots of what I call fine-grained, messy stuff in them. They have spaces for people to start up businesses we can't even imagine, especially in the digital age. You can do anything anywhere or everything everywhere on your handheld device. What you can't do on your handheld device is have a face-to-face -face serendipitous meeting with somebody in the street. That's what, that's what places are for. That's what real urbanism is. That's what towns are. If we're going to make new towns, we have to understand that. So we have to understand how the nature of capital, short-term returns, and all those things that have been discussed and was highlighted uh, in the Letwin Review and in, sorry, in other, in other uh, cases. I'm getting too excited here, sorry. Um, we have to recognize that um, the way we design the land and the money and the frameworks in, and the flexibility with which we, we design and the human activity that we allow for is going to have a huge impact on the final beauty of the places we build. So um, my message is simply, yes, of course, design the buildings. Uh, use the architects. I've no doubt that uh, design in this country is more than capable of building beautiful places. But unless we get the design of the land ownership, the land uh, procurement and, uh, and so forth, and unless we get the money, the long-term patient stewarded capital right, we are not going to achieve the results we want.
you hear me? We just switch. Can you hear me at the back? Great. Um, uh, thank you. They were all really interesting contributions, especially uh, the agreement on these you know, new towns need to be beautiful. Um, so I want to go to the audience. I mean, we have half an hour for questions, which is brilliant. Uh, so if anyone has a question, can they raise their hand? Uh, okay. All right, I will pick two at a time. And uh, please, you have to state your name and your organisation, and you have 15 seconds to say your question, not your statement. So, um, gentleman just here, uh, and then uh, gentleman Ken holding up. Thank you. Uh, Geoffrey Lean, now am I? Well, to my surprise, 50th year of writing about these um, areas as a journalist. Um, Oliver, fascinating stuff. Been very, very encouraging and fascinating stuff this morning from everyone. But Oliver, could I ask you a bit more specific? You spoke about a few substantial settlements. I mean, you give us some idea of what kind of numbers you're thinking of and in, in size and, and numbers itself. And of course, the big question: Where are we talking? All over the country, concentrate in a particular part. Green belt, outside green belt. This is where the this is the, where the devil will be in the detail, I guess. Just let this gentleman. Daniel, <coughs> Daniel Scharf from PFT Planning. The other challenge for you is carbon. So your neighbour, the RICS, produced whole life carbon assessment for the built environment. 50% of carbon is embodied or embedded at practical completion. It's before it lived in. So how are we going to build new settlements which are even more carbon intensive due to the infrastructure, due to the churches, due to the schools? We've got to build, use what we've got, at least during the climate emergency. I mean, that's the policy exchange to declare a climate emergency at the beginning of all, all meetings, actually, because then you've listened to Greta Thunberg. And we've got to use what we've got. We subdivide and we distribute existing built infrastructure because we otherwise we overshoot carbon budgets, inevitably. Okay. Thank you. Right, so Oliver, would you like to answer a question on size and where? Um, yes. Um, uh, well, I mean, the first, first answer is um, clearly... Uh, the number of these uh, and the locations of them are not things that one individual sitting at a policy exchange meeting ought to dream up. Uh, that requires considerable de deliberation by by, uh, by government and by parliament and so on. Um, as to the size, um, I think they can be, uh, uh, in some cases, very large uh, if got right. Um, uh, and uh, uh, as to the location, um, let me give you just one example because I think it's very illustrative, both of the question of size and of the question of place, uh, as in uh, geographical location. Um, as part of my report, I went to um, Greenwich uh, and uh, saw the development that's going on there. Uh, which is uh, is actually, in our, in our joint terms, pretty progressive uh, because of the way it's structured and uh, the very profound role of the housing association that's involved and also of two levels of local government uh, and the way that, and I very much agree with the points about the land uh, value capture and so the way that the land value has been captured. And so, so in many ways, it's a very good example. Um, uh, and, and when I was there, I, I stood on a... Um, a, a, a deck, a sort of platform that's been created there, um, and I looked out um, uh, and up river, if I mean up river, um, towards, I think I do mean up river, towards central London, and uh, um, uh, so various things came in upon me as I stood there. Um, one is, I, I wasn't um, very far at all from Battersea or Westminster, where I, I, I've lost track of exactly what the value per square foot is of something built on the Thames in Battersea, but it's enormous. And there I was, really not very far away at all, a stone's throw uh, away, really, uh, and the, the value is much, much lower. And between the two, vast areas of post-industrial landscape. Um, dominated by towering uh, national grid uh, 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 pylons, uh, utterly uh, outdated. Uh, uh, huge uh, factories, alas, 
uh, no longer uh, uh, producing uh, anything, uh, but too expensive to demolish. Uh, um, uh, so do, do you have to chew up vast areas of uh, southeastern um, uh, countryside in order to create uh, a beauty uh, amidst current ugliness and provide hundreds of thousands of people with accommodation that they want and can afford of various kinds in our capital city? Answer, no, you don't. You just require to seize the opportunity. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, of course, that's not a complete answer to your question by any means, but I think it does indicate the scope for what we're talking about. Uh, and of course, there's a thousand practical difficulties involved in, in getting there, but it's not insurmountable. The, the underlying economics, once you've captured the land value, uh, are, are perfectly doable and the demand is almost illimitable. Um, Alex, uh, the, the politics of Greenbelt are slightly different for Labour than for Conservative in the sense that like, Labour has less votes in the Greenbelt than the Conservatives. So I was wondering what, what, what was your position on building, so we build a new town in the Greenbelt? Well, that's a very interesting question for me. But, uh, I mean, first and foremost, I think we, we tend to think of what's happening in London, never mind the Green Belt. And uh, Oliver's already talked about it. The Mayor of uh, London has actually identified sufficient land for 650,000 homes without breaking into the Green Belt. And that goes a long, long way to meeting the provision that's necessary in this part of the country. Our, as far as the, the Green Belt itself is concerned, uh, our attitude is that uh, there may be ways in which uh, they, they, can, they can alter boundaries in order to expand in particular areas. But I think the most important thing for me is that we need to be able to take communities with us. And although that's a very easy thing to say and a very, very difficult thing to achieve. And so how are we actually going to work with communities to help them buy into the vision of how we actually solve the housing crisis? I'm not sure that, uh, you know, this vast swathes of green land, as all of us says, need to be used. We need to look very closely at brownfield sites as well. In my own constituency, we've, I don't know, it's a small number, but there was a, a joinery site and it was, the land wasn't very clean, but they've cleaned it up and they're building 700 homes in that, in a small town in the northeast of England. 700 homes. And those pieces of land are replicated throughout every town and city across the nation. And I think we need to look very, very closely at that without getting too worried about breaking into Greenbelt. I think one, one type of brownfield site that we should think a bit more actively about, and I'm saying this because I can see a few former and current employees of Shelter here, is uh, golf courses, which we have plenty of in outer London, and a lot of them are owned by local authorities, and, you know, the garden's already there. It could be quite a, a unique development opportunity. Um, well, well, speaking I mean, as a Scott Jack, I mean, I, you know, in the home of golf, I mean, I won't have anything that's going to compromise the golf courses. But if it can be, create those beautiful spaces, uh, you know, for the community built around them, I'm all for it. Um, I, I suppose uh, just on, on that question, I would say that um, I've observed, certainly in London, that the growth of London is not limited by a green belt so much as what I call uh, a blue collar, a de-gentrifying uh, suburban landscape that really does need some uh, retrofitting, if only to meet green, uh, some better green credentials, but certainly with an opportunity, uh, and I see my old colleague there who did a piece of work, uh, 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 Susan in the audience there, who did a piece of work to show that actually there's space for over a million homes uh, by densifying around transport nodes in, in, the, in the suburbs. It's really, really challenging because you have to address the financial challenges and the land ownership challenges of an owner occupied sort of segmented land ownership uh, but that is the kind of uh, radical sort of solution I think we do need to be looking at and why we have to spend, uh, pay so much attention to that land and money uh, component of, uh, of the question. What I want to do is, is address sort of both, almost both, both questions that have just been asked together. I think the uh, embedded carbon argument is a really, really important one because, uh, and this was brought home to me uh, a few weeks ago talking uh, to uh, a Chinese delegation we were hosting at UCL, uh, where the huge concern is how on earth they retrofit glass and steel late 20th century urban environments to suit the 21st century, which actually means retrofitting a much finer grain sort of urban fabric. 
And uh, there's a recognition there that actually urbanism, towns and cities are in and of themselves um, a much greener proposition because they're capable of adaptation. And one of the saddest things about all the building we've done over the last sort of uh, half century or so is that it is uh, we're increasingly now talking about obsolescence. It's not capable of being adequately repurposed. Uh, so even offices aren't very good at being repurposed in many cases to residential. Um, and uh, the sort of built form we need is one that uh, has survived the test of centuries. Uh, a streetscape with flexible, simple buildings that are capable of being adapted because nobody can predict what on earth we're going to need to do in them in future. Uh, what we do know is that we'll probably be doing something quite different with them in 50 years to what we're doing now. So um, that simplicity and flexibility is really, really key. And is and you know, the, the walkable urbanist uh, urbanism is inherently uh, greener than anything that's single use and relies on car um, uh, ownership and, uh, and usage. So we really do have to be thinking uh, the, uh, very much more holistically about the green agenda. The solution is not green technology so much as green places. Brilliant. Okay, I'm going to get a couple more questions in the middle of the audience. Um, the main at the front. Okay, um, so there's a person sitting in the middle of the aisle there, no, no, further that way. And then um, the lady on the side there. Uh, hi there, my name's Rebecca Wakefield. I work for a company called PLMR. Um, I think it's very interesting that the uh, Green Belt has become such a sacrosanct word, and I think it's very easy to forget that not all Green Belt is sort of beautiful, lush, rolling countryside. Um, we have sort of great swathes of very inaccessible sort of scrubland um, that even though it isn't beautiful countryside, uh, local authorities and predominantly sort of NIMBY communities are never going to get behind the idea of a new town sort of right next to them. Um, do you think or agree that potentially if local authorities were able to release this um, Greenbelt land um, back into sort of circulation um, that we could sort of increase house building without the sort of Greenbelt tarnish idea? And then the lady thing. Thanks. I'm Christian Quigley from Newington Communications, and I wanted to ask the panel for your thoughts on what the balance should be between private developers and council and housing association development in delivering new towns. Okay. Two very good questions. Uh, I guess to Oliver first, if that's right. Um, well, uh, uh, gr green belt means all sorts of things, um, and uh, it is... Uh, certainly very various in its um, uh, current uh, ecological and aesthetic uh, value. Uh, it, it is, of course, a concept that, that is founded on the principle that you don't want ribbon development of things just uh, uh, happening one after another um, uh, within metres of the last settlement so that eventually the whole country just becomes one very long uh, a series of housing developments and, and that's actually really rather a good idea uh, to avoid that. Um, uh, I have in my constituency a, a town of Sherbourne which is one of the gems of the country um, and uh, I speak as a wholly impartial observer and um, the next door constituency against which I ha have nothing at all contains a, a town called Yeovil and Yeovil is not very far from Sherbourne and People in Sherbourne are extremely keen not to see a lot of housing between Yeovil and Sherbourne because they would like Sherbourne to be Sherbourne. And for all I know, they're not my constituents, uh, people in Yeovil would like not to see a lot of housing between Yeovil and Sherbourne because they'd like to be Yeovil. Um, uh, and I think that that's, a, in, in general, a good principle. The sort of example that I was talking about, indeed, that many of us have been talking about on the platform, doesn't raise those sorts of issues. And if we genuinely were to run out of land that doesn't create massive political uh, objections, um, uh, then we'd have to think again. But actually, we're living in a country where there's a massive opportunity for doing the kinds of things that we've all three of us been saying on the panel can be done. Um, the Georgians built hugely intensively in squares. 
that the square, the Georgian square, is one of the most brilliant devices for intensive development that's ever been invented anywhere in the world. Um, a, a, a small amount of mathematics will prove to you that a Georgian square contains a, as much uh, housing and more than a tower block would in the middle of the Georgian square, going many, many stories upwards, um, and is sort of 400,000 times nicer to live in. Um, and a great deal better for young families, and, 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 and. And by the way, also you can have birds and trees and flowers and so on in the middle, uh, uh, as you often do with Georgian Square. So one can be imaginative about this. We don't have to just sort of leap into uh, the, the, the highly controversial. Um, uh, as to the, the role of different kinds of body in promoting uh, the, the new chat, I, I have become absolutely persuaded. It's, I, I think, in many ways, the central... Uh, feature of the conclusions I reached in, in, in my work that um, we, we've made a fundamental mistake in, in our country which is very unusual internationally. Um, there's almost no other European example of a country that has decided or has sleepwalked into handing over to private developers the development of very large sites, uh, let alone new towns. Um, uh, uh, it's just not a sensible proposition. Um, uh, I, I have abs I mean, I don't share the sort of Manichaean view that many people have of, of large private developers. I'm nothing against large private developers. They all seem to be charming people, and and many of them are very good businessmen and women. And they, although actually mainly men, uh, 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 and they they. Um, uh, some of them build very nice things. Some of them do not build very nice things, but uh, uh, that's the way of everything else, too. There are people who make good things of every kind and people who make bad things of every kind. So there's nothing special about the developers, but they are business people. They're, they're in business. That's Their motive is to make a profit, a perfectly respectable motive. That is not how public policy in developing housing and developing places can possibly proceed. Um, we don't, we don't subcontract to uh, the private sector decisions about any other aspect of our national life in that way um, uh, and therefore they are the wrong people to hand over a very large thing to. One of the effects is that people like Richard Bacon who want to have self-build and custom build get squeezed out. Another effect is that the social housing gets squeezed down. Another effect is that the affordable housing gets squeezed down. Another effect is that they're, they're exactly out of whichever pattern book it is, whichever builder it is, built over and over and over again because that's how they know how to do it, and so on. It's all the wrong way around. And so that the right people to be in charge of these large operations are people who are acting in the public interest, uh, not people who are acting uh, as commercial operators. Of course the commercial operators are going to be, need to be brought in to build parts of these sites, um, alongside, I hope, small builders and all sorts of people, including self-build and custom-build. <coughs> but um, it seems to me that in that context, housing associations and local authorities have a huge role to play. Um, uh, in the case of a new town, of course, you typically won't have a local authority, which is why I said I think we will need to be, if we're going to progress this, imaginative about the structure of governance that we create for a new, uh, a, a large new settlement. Uh, in the case I was talking about, uh, sort of between Greenwich and Battersea, if I can put it in those terms, we have a mayor. We have a mayor of London. Um, I was able to cooperate extremely effectively, notwithstanding the fact that Sadiq is from a different political party, with the Mayor of London in doing my report because he has a very substantially similar vision of what is needed in our capital. And uh, it would be perfectly possible for him to, and, and whoever was the Mayor, uh, to commission a, an appropriate body, appropriately structured, to take this sort of thing forward in the public interest, no doubt working with people like housing associations to do it, and then, of course, to bring in the private sector to do what they do, but under the control of uh, entities that are acting in the public interest. Are you going to agree with what? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to bounce, bounce all of us greater knowledge on uh, pretty versus shrubland uh, in, the out, in the outer cities. Uh, but, I mean, the answer to the question is simply yes, if that land can be released. But taking communities with us, it, it's certainly part of the answer going forward. But I want to talk really about the, uh, you know, the mix of uh, developers and, uh, you know, uh, public associations, uh, housing associations. I mean, I looked at the London, uh, London Olympics and I think the tremendous work that was done there by the delivery authority and actually de delivering that mixed project 
very, very successfully. And I believe, uh, I know some of the budgets were, were a bit different. People argue about the budgets, but they actually delivered what is, was exactly needed within the timescales that were required. And I wonder, as, as Oliver and I seem to be in agreeing, that some of the sort of public authority that can actually be the controlling influence, whether we're developing a huge site in, in inner London under the mayor, or whether we're looking at uh, part of this shrub land that the lady at the further back mentioned, whether there's an authority that can be set up that can actually oversee it and work in partnership with private developers, as Oliver says, but also bring housing associations on board. But we have to be able to go much further in terms of policy before we can even get there. We need to be able to ensure that local authorities or these authority, new authorities that we could create actually have the capacity to do what we want them to do. Well, I want to see local authorities build more council houses uh, and our idea is that we will rebuild the capacity in local authorities in order to allow them to do that so that uh, you know when we can make the monies available they can crack on. We also want local authorities to be able to borrow. Similarly housing associations and I understand that housing associations only use a very small fraction of their uh, actual uh, borrowing uh, capability. Uh, against uh, some of it. I've seen some shake heads, so I will bow to greater knowledge. But my understanding is that they're not all, I know the one in my area isn't, they're not actually exploiting fully their borrowing power. So there are all man manner of ways to bring money into the pot, but ultimately we actually need somebody who, as Oliver says, is going to control it and actually make it happen. Um, I used to get into huge trouble in my last job by pointing out that at current rates of build, uh, Ebb's fleet is going to take about 110 years to deliver. Uh, so clearly just de designing and planning units, whether they're on Greenbelt or Bramfield, you know, it's, it, it, it's almost Im immaterial unless we find new ways of uh, delivering and delivering at speed and delivering far more than just housing, uh, you know, household or housing units or indeed just sort of social housing that, that's been delivered. If we're going to deliver whole places with everything that people need in them, uh, it seems to me that it's essential we have land ownership mechanisms where the interests of the occupiers, the long-term interests of the occupiers, that is the health, the economy, um, the vitality of the people in the place are aligned with the landowning interests and I'm very interested to observe new emerging uh, public pa uh, private partnerships, co-ownership of land, for example what's happening with British land and southern Canada water, I think uh, and that co-investment model uh, is, is, is something that's going to be very interesting to watch. I, I, I don't think the answer lies solely in council owned homes or solely in private sector development. I think it, this is a very much about mixing things up in, in new ways and finding ways of we have to cooperate together and it means much more uh, community involvement the involvement of real people and understanding uh, this, this is a, a, an investment imperative global investment imperative in the 21st century so investors want long-term income streams they can no longer rely on short-term capital growth in any sector at least of all real estate. So therefore, the quality and uh, longevity of income streams is going to be completely reliant on providing people with what they want and need. So I am actually quite optimistic. I think that the interests of landowners, uh, investors, and people are becoming increasingly aligned. Challenges, finding new mechanisms to make that work. Uh, can, can, can I just um, say something? It's both my fellow panellists have mentioned Ebb's Fleet. And I, I went to Ebb's Fleet and interviewed the people involved in Ebb's Fleet, and it's absolutely fascinating. Everything's been said about it is true. It's very, very, very painfully slow. Uh, and, and one thing became absolutely crystal clear, which is that the poor people, who, who are, it's only good people, I think, who are uh, officially in charge of Ebb's Fleet, have a deficiency, which is not their fault. They don't own it. Yeah. They, they don't control the land. Um, so they are supplicants to the developers. And in that relationship, um, developers uh, uh, 40, uh, supplicants love, um, is the obvious result. And they have lots of life. <laughs> it just doesn't yeah. get you very far. It, 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 I, to come back on that, I did a lot of work uh, on Ebbsfleet back in the day. Ebbsfleet has the potential to, to behave like a, a new, or enable the whole area to behave like a new London borough. 
uh, regardless of what the political control is. That, that's its, what I call, place potential. It's 50-year place potential. There is no way, it seems to me, given current mechanisms, getting from where we are now to that full place potential. And unless we start changing the dynamics of that land ownership, the, the finance and so forth, we're never going to get there. And that's true of any place. You know, I'm not picking just on Ebsley. This is a really good case study of what needs to happen everywhere. Let's go for two more questions. Um, gentleman in the blue shirt and... Uh, oh, gosh. The <laughs> gentleman in the blue suit as well. Uh, apologies if you didn't get to ask a question. Name, organisation... Question in 15 seconds, please. Thank you. I'm Liam Halligan. I'm a journalist. Um, great comments so far, by the way. Uh, thank you. Sir Oliver, um, just after the government responded to your review, a joint press, a joint statement by Civitas and Shelter, who aren't usual bedfellows, said that without legislative, while well, praising your review, what, without legislative reform, they said specifically to the 1961 Land Compensation Act, uh, the Letwin plans are at this point at serious risk of failure, so I wanted your response to that. More generally, how big a role do you think land capture value can really play in funding the schools, hospitals, infrastructure, the common areas that form amid local amenities and place that we've been talking about today, taking communities with us when we have new build? Because I think your report is really associated with that idea, even though some people think it didn't really deliver that idea. And finally, um, do you agree with the July 2016 House of Lords report that said the large uh, house builders in the UK, quotes, display all the characteristics of an oligopoly? Thank you. Okay, then the gentleman in the navy suit. Yes. Thank you. Uh, John Myers from Yimby Alliance. Uh, thanks for a brilliant panel. Um, when we've built all these beautiful new settlements, the residents are probably going to want to set up neighbourhood plans, which I, I think Sir Oliver invented. Um, they seem to, seem to work really well in parishes, uh, but it seems to be a bit tougher to write a neighbourhood plan in a city. Is it time to sort of look, look back at the lessons of what we've learned in neighbourhood planning and see how we could get more housing out of neighbourhood plans in cities? Okay. Two brilliant questions. Okay, uh, so Oliver, you can tackle all of them if you like, and then we'll go along the panel. And these will be final remarks. Um, well, uh, uh, to Liam's question, uh, f first of all, I, I hope that there will be um, uh, uh, legislative changes. Uh, I think there, there need to be um, uh, some, some of what I recommended can be done by secondary legislation, some will require primary legislation, yes. Um, uh, and I, I hope that in due course we'll see that. Uh, what the government has so far done is to announced that it's going to make changes to planning guidance, which is fine, but doesn't get you nearly uh, all the way, uh, very far from. Um, uh, uh, I've had an interesting and continuing dialogue with uh, Shelter and others about the precise character of the legislative changes required to get what is our joint aim, which is land value capture. Uh, and uh, that can go on being discussed, but uh, some legislative change we will certainly need. Um, uh, uh, how much value can be released for social and aesthetic and ecological purposes by, um, uh, by capturing land value, uh, uh, of course, is site dependent. Uh, if you have a hugely um, uh, uh, derelict and uh, polluted site requiring enormous um, reclamation, uh, uh, enormously costly reclamation, and one that requires also hugely complicated and expensive transport links that don't currently exist, well then you're going to have, and, and particularly if the uh, uh, value of the open market housing for sale in that area is lowish, uh, uh, then you're going to be hard pressed to release very large amounts of value for other purposes, clearly. And that's where public subsidy will have to uh, come in. Uh, there are, in point of fact, enormous sums of public subsidy already available uh, under such circumstances. Uh, uh, you, sir, are going to become one of the world experts, no doubt, on housing <laughs> infrastructure funds and things of that sort. Uh, I just spent two or three days listening to officials in MHCLG describing all these things to me, and my head was spinning by the time they'd finished. Um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to remember all the different streams of funding there are, um, 
Uh, and the question why we don't seem to be getting nearly as much benefit as you might expect from them, I think it resolves into the, the answer because they are not concentrated together in the right kind of way, in the right kinds of places, and are spent instead on places which didn't need them because you had that value capture. If you have a relatively unpolluted site with relatively slight transport uh, link uh, costs uh, in a place of very high value, and the sort of area of London that I was talking about is very likely to fall into uh, at least two of those categories. It is polluted, but it probably doesn't have very high transport costs and it has enormous values. Um, uh, then you can liberate in phenomenal amounts of money from land value capture. Uh, you then subsidise publicly the, uh, the reclamation and uh, bingo. You, you've got loads of money to spend on parks and schools and all the other things that make life pleasant and useful and enable people to do all the things that Yolanda was talking about, which is indeed what we want people to be able to do in the place they live in and what they want to do. So that is doable. Um, uh, do, do I think that the um, major developers are an oligopoly? No. Uh, uh, they, I, I have a very good reason for thinking that they're not an oligopoly because if they were an oligopoly it would be uh, unlawful and the um, uh, competition authorities studied that question and came to the conclusion that they were not operating unlawfully. So no. 2008. Um, yes, but the situation is much the same. Well, it has and it hasn't. Uh, actually, I think the bigger problem, much, much bigger problem is not, not that they are acting unlawfully or anti-competitively, but on the contrary, that we hand over to them an enormous amount of power we should never be giving them. Um, we let them capture the land, we let them hand the land value over to the landowners, and then we let them operate their business models, and we have them, with huge amounts of staff and expertise, facing wildly overpressed and understaffed local authority planning departments, whose personnel change every uh, 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 few months or years. I, I went round uh, uh, site after site where a hugely impressive group of people from the developer were in the minibus with me. One individual who had spent uh, you know, a very small fraction of their time on the site and it only appeared on the scene the last couple of years, who was simply listening to what the developers said about the site because they had no idea at all what was going on in the site. Um, this is not a sensible way for a, a government, uh, in this case local government, and the developers to be situated vis-a-vis -vis one another. And that's the big problem, and it's all about land ownership and land value capture and control in the public interest. And if we can get that right, uh, all these issues about oligopoly and so on would disappear off into the horizon. Quick comment on neighbourhood planning, then we get to Andy. Oh, I'm so sorry, so I agree entirely. I think we do need, we do need <laughs> a new generation of neighbourhood planning for... Uh, uh, our cities. There is a little bit of neighbourhood planning that has been done in some parts of our cities. Often, I regret to say, against intensive opposition from local authorities, including conservative local authorities in some of our uh, uh, cities. Uh, uh, we need a new model that's more powerful. If we're going to do the sort of thing that Richard Bacon wants to see in our cities, and we need to see them happening in our cities too, uh, we're going to need uh, new kinds of neighbourhood planning. Andy. Well, I'm going to start by asking uh, Oliver to provide me with a summary of all these funding streams. It'll save me having a hundred <laughs> meetings. Uh, so I think that would be very helpful if you don't mind. But it's when it comes to land value, I, I have seen uh, something in the last few days that's saying that the value of the land can multiply a hundred times just because somebody says, yes, right. we'll build housing there. Right. So why should that? Why should one individual or one organisation have that value? They simply shouldn't. And that's why the uh, ambition I think we would share is to make sure that we acquire land for development at nearer the base level uh, of its value when uh, when it became first for sale, when we first identified it for housing. And I think that's one way in which we unlock that particular value. But, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm on the, at the bottom of that steep learning curve at the moment on those things. Um, as far as um, the... Uh, you know, neighbourhood plans are concerned. I mean, I believe very much in this, but I believe in the, the, the very lowest point within within communities when it comes to organising plans. So a bottom-up approach. Ask communities what they want. Talk to the housing the the, uh, the residents associations. Talk to people knocking on doors and say, what do you actually want in the future? That should be the baseline for your planning, and then you build everything on top of that, all the way up to the thing that you have to submit to the government that they then take. 12 months to actually approve or disapprove of but uh, so I, you know I agree very much that uh, you know with Oliver that we actually need to take that uh, much further forward. Yolanda will anyone speak for the land do? That's good. <laughs> well w one thing I would say is be re really careful of land value capture issues because uh, the problem if, if land value capture turns into a land tax as 
for example, SIL has, it has the risk of actually discouraging the very thing that you want to encourage. So you have to be really, really careful about it. And I think um, we also need to get away from the mentality that parks and schools and so forth are costs. Because with a different type of uh, land value capture, in other words, long-term land ownership, you'll actually find they add value and they give you your long-term rental growth success of place, which means you prosper. Anyway, so the, you know, they actually value add, not, not costs, depending on the time frame you, you look at them in. And that, that's really key. And linking into the neighbourhood planning uh, piece, I think neighbourhood planning is extremely important and it actually can go with land capture. If you look at a paper called Super uh, which we, we produ I produced with uh, HTA architects and various others. Um, the the challenge of re of urbanising sub the suburbs lies in collective action between groups of households. You can actually get quite a lot more density by turning semis into terraces and putting views behind them and urbanising those landscapes. The, the mechanism to do that is to use the incentive of land value uplift and development profit, if you like, to incentivize those individual landowners to act together. In those circumstances, neighborhood plans are an absolutely essential part of the process to achieve those sorts of cumulative small scale uh, in interventions, uh, hand in hand with permitted development, whatever, whatever else it takes. So uh, this is yet another case where we just have to join up all the individual agencies. Um, and uh, on the comment on house builders, I'm not going to get into knocking house builders because they are the only bloody show in town. They don't build city, but they build something. They build the only thing we've got at the moment. What we've got to think about is additionality. What else? Who else can we involve? Self builders. Uh, local authorities, housing associations, new mechanisms, uh, you know, community cooperatives, whatever it takes. Uh, we've got to think more, not, not less. Brilliant. I, I think that's a hugely knowledgeable and even optimistic panel event. So can we say thank you to, firstly, the Policy Exchange event staff who make all this happen, and then the fantastic speakers.